So we're on page 49 of your notes, and we're now starting to talk about the NO ligand. Now, in this case here, if you were to look at the just the regular Lewis dot diagram, we have 11 electrons in this species. So when you do draw it out, you end up with one extra electron just by itself. So you do have a radical species. When this is bound to a metal, we call this nitrosal when bound to a metal. Now, because of this interesting situation, you have two different things can happen with this ligand. Uh, you can have it either bond with one electron or with the two electrons. You end up with two different geometries. So the first one we're going to look at, look at is this one here. So the linear bonding. In this case here, it's giving three electrons. Okay. So when you're doing your electron counting, uh, if you're doing the neutral counting method, this is giving three electrons. So one from the radical and two from the lone pair. Now this species here is really similar to our CO species, so it's a good pi acceptor. So for back bonding, like CO. And since you're giving it three electrons, it's really good for electron poor metals. And this is similar to, and we'll get into when we actually, when we talk about electron counting, I will talk about that. So that's the one is the linear one, but you can also have it bond in a bent fashion. So where your lone pair is still located on the nitrogen, and nitrogen is sp2. It's about 120 degrees right there. So this is our bent geometry, and it's giving one electron to the metal. So this is good when you have electron rich metal species. Mm -hmm. Now you can also have, since we have those three electrons to play with, this can be a bridging ligand where, I'll just put this like that, it can give one electron to one metal and two electrons to another metal. So you can have it as bridging. It is giving a total of three electrons. So if you go down in your notes to the electron, electron counting section, and I won't pull them up, but just looking at it, if you're doing the covalent method, so that's where you don't take into consideration the oxidation state or the charge on a ligand, uh, you're looking at how many electrons are donated and how many you would have normally on the metal center if it was in its neutral state. So for the linear one, you're gonna have three electrons is what you're giving. For the bent, you're giving only one, which is kind of what we talked about. <clears throat> now, if you're doing the ionic counting method, though, you're going to think of this a bit of a different way. Okay, you're going to think when it's linear, it's almost like you have an NO plus ligand. So, when you're doing your oxidation count for your metal, you're going to consider this as having a plus charge, and it's giving two electrons though. So this is different from any of the other ligands that we've seen, say the X minus ligands or anything like that. So you can keep this in mind here. So this is for ionic. And when you're looking at the bent ones now, this is like having an NO minus ligand, so just like a regular X minus, giving two electrons. So for ionic counting, in each case, it's two electrons, but the charge is gonna be different. So it's gonna give you a different oxidation state on your metal. So let's do two different examples that we have in there. These. So that first one, this out here, we have a triphosphine on iridium, CO, bent NO, Cl, and this whole thing is positive. So we're told that our NO is bent. So it's giving us a little bit of information. So remember this one is like NO minus, okay? Now let's do this the two different ways. If we do this using the ionic counting method, 
So if we want to look at our oxidation state here, ionic first. So up in here, triphenylphosphine is neutral. TO is neutral. NO when it's bent is minus one. CL is also minus one. So that means that our iridium has to be three plus. So if you try and find iridium on your periodic table now, this means that we have a D6 species. So if we were to count this up now, you have six electrons from iridium. Now you're going to go and look at the rest of what you have here. You have every phosphine, remember that nitro or that phosphorus atom is giving two electrons. So there's going to be a four total from your phosphine. The CO giving two electrons. Two electrons. The NO is giving two electrons. And our CL is also giving two electrons. So this gives us a total of 16 electrons for this species. Now, if we were to do this the neutral way now, remember neutral, you don't take into consideration any charges on the ligands. Uh, or the oxidation state, but you need to take into consideration this one over here. So in this case here then, iridium would be within D9 species. So because you're thinking of it in a neutral, um, no charge to it. So you're gonna have nine electrons. Our phosphines don't change because those are neutral species giving two electrons. You're still getting two per phosphorus. Same with the carbonyl. Now, when it comes to the NO, remember this is bent, so it's only giving one electron. The next one is the chloride. So remember chloride, you're thinking of everything as being neutral. So this guy here is also only giving one electron. And now you have to take that charge up here into consideration. So that's actually going to remove an electron from our count. So minus one. To do this, hopefully we end up with the same number, 16 electrons. Let's do another example. So cobalt. This diars and O. And this is two plus. So first of all, what is diars? This is a bidentate arsenic ligand. It has some other stuff on here. So each arsenic is acting like this as a two electron donor, neutral. Okay, so two electrons and it's neutral. Okay. Now up in here then, let's think about if we want to do ionic first. Our actually we don't know in this case here what our NO is. We don't know if it's bent or it's linear. So the easiest thing to do would be to do the neutral method first. And let's just see how many electrons we get with out including that NO. And let's just see um, if that gives us any information. So if we're doing neutral first, the cobalt is D9. So we're going to have nine electrons for cobalt. Each, this is per arsenic, okay, two electrons per arsenic. So each arsenic is getting two electrons, and I have two of these ligands. So that's eight electrons coming from these two bidentate ligands. And then I have to look at that charge that I have up here as well. So in this case here, we have to take off two electrons. So we end up with a total of 15 electrons without counting that NO. So remember when we're doing electron counting in organometallic species, they really want to be 18 electrons. We want 18 electrons. So that's telling us then that, you know what? Our NO can give three electrons. That will get us right up to uh, our 18 electron species. So which one is the three electron one again? That is when it's linear. Okay, so if you just wanna check this out then and do this by the onic method, remember when it's linear, it's like it's acting as an NO plus ligand. 
So if we go back up here now and try and find our oxidation state of the cobalt, this is plus one. These guys are neutral, and overall I'm getting a plus two. So that means that this guy here also has to be plus one. Okay. So we have cobalt plus, that'll be D8 species. So eight electrons from cobalt. Our arsenic ligands are not changing at all. They're still giving eight electrons. And when we're doing the electron count for either a bent or a linear NO, it's always giving two electrons. Remember that charge is taken into consideration when we're getting oxidation state. And there's our 18 electrons. So it works out both ways. Now let's move on and do nitrogen ligands. So nitrogen is pretty stable, very benign. 80% of our atmosphere really doesn't react with much, but you can actually react it with something. It's isoelectronic with CO and NO plus, but it's much more rare as a ligand. And you can kind of look at this and see, right? You have a triple bond, um, which is pretty stable, pretty short. You have no polarity in there whatsoever. So it's kind of boring ligand actually, but you can actually get it. And the way we, we see multiple different ways, either just down to one ligand or it can also be bridging. So one way you're gonna see it is end on. Remember it looks like CO, right? So just like CO, you can have end on binding. So end on, uh, this might also be called terminal. Well, and so in terms of our little, Hapticity, it's an eta one. Right? And you can also have this guy, or we have all this big source of electrons in these triple bonds or in these pi bonds. So you can have side on bonding as well, similar to what we've seen with our alkenes and alkynes. So picture that then with our nitrogen, our metal nitrogen. In this case here, it's some of the electrons from one of those double or those um, pi bonds that's being donated to the metal center. In that case there then, this would be side on, and it's an eta two. Now each of these cases you can also have back bonding. Remember, just like CO and NO plus, we have these pi star orbitals, nice empty pi star orbitals. So you will see back bonding from the metal to the nitrogen. That's actually really what helps stabilize it. Same with over here, you still have those pi star orbitals that are located in good symmetry, good overlap with the metal. So you're gonna see the same thing, okay, into the pi star orbitals. Good, now this can also act as a bridging ligand, like I said, picture up here, you have two ends to this guy with identical source of electrons on this side, right? So you could have it then, where you have metal, nitrogen, nitrogen, and metal. So this would be end-on bridging. And also if you think of this, you have a second pi bond over here that you can use to bond to another metal. So very similarly, you can have now side-on bridging. Put our nitrogen here, metal. So we can have a situation like this going on. Remember, you still have that back bonding, a lot going on in these guys. Okay. Look at all those electrons being pushed all over the place. So here is your side on bridging. Good. Now, many years we didn't have any isolated nitrogen complexes and people actually thought that you couldn't form them uh, mainly because of that lack of polarity here and this extreme stability in this case but they did start to find them and actually they increased in popularity um, pretty big now and the whole intent is to try and activate this guy to be able to use this as a source of nitrogen let's say for making ammonia which would be uh, the best case scenario since that's one of the leading chemicals in the world um, mainly for fertilizers, but of course explosives as well. Um, and that would be excellent if you can actually take N2 and break it down in such a way 
that you can uh, fixate it to a metal sensor and turn it into ammonia that way instead of using the Haber-Bosch process, which is uh, pretty energy intensive. So continue, that's a whole area of research out there on that, being able to break that triple bond to just create a metal nitrogen or a metal nitride bond instead. Now, we talked a little bit about that back bonding. Uh, CO, unfortunately, is a better back bar sigma donor and a better pi acceptor. So in order to get um, complexes with CO and NO, N2 on the same metal is pretty hard. Okay, they're not that stable. So complexes with CO and N2 not that stable. So again, that's because CO is a really good sigma donor and a really good pi acceptor. So much better than N2 because you have that polarity, because you have the pi star really located more on the C, whereas these guys are really similar. Uh, but you can get it. It's observed in a couple cases, but really only at low temperatures. So they have been able to isolate these chromium complexes. Five of those. And N2, and they've isolated the one with two N2 ligands as well. Okay, but these are only at low temperature. They're not that stable at all. Uh, but if you replace one of these COs instead with, say, a phosphine, phosphine ligand. Now, phosphines are not good pi acceptors, not like CO. So in this case here, you're going to be keeping more of that electron density on the metal. Okay, so it's going to be, therefore, more electron density on the metal. And therefore, that electron density is available to back bond with the nitrogen and stabilize that bond. Okay? Therefore, more pi back bonding. N2. So you're going to see more complexes like that. Uh, an example of one like that, aluminum um, compound with CO, but only three of them, and they've replaced two of those with these tricyclohexyl phosphines. And they have been able to isolate that one right there. Okay, that's it for this section.